Hello again. In this module, we're going to take a closer look at the value proposition. The value proposition sits at the center of the business model canvas, and it's crucial not only to identifying how you deliver value to your customers, but in fact who those customers are, because your customers are defined by the people who see value in what you're offering. So it's pretty important to get a clear picture of what that is. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, is a proverb. And in this context, what it means is that if customers don't like what you're offering, then there's no point in blaming them. It's your problem, not theirs. You have to find customers who do like what you're offering, or you have to change what you're offering so that your customers like it. So the value proposition. What customer problem are we solving? What value do we deliver to the customer? What bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? That's easy to define, but it's actually quite tricky to get a handle on. In the example of thank you water, remember we had the bottled water, the convenience, the feeling good about ourselves, knowing where our money is going. If you look at that, only one of those is actually a tangible product. The rest are um, emotional issues. And the retailers, of course, just want lots of sales. Here's another perspective. It's called the Value Proposition Canvas, and we'll provide a link to it on Blackboard. It's from the same people who make the Business Model Canvas. So a way of looking at this is to look at your customers and go, well, what do they need to do? What are the jobs that they need to do? Well, for the retailers, obviously, they need to choose products that are going to sell. And if you think about a supermarket, what they're really doing is renting out shelf space. So what they want is for the products to sell as quickly as possible. Because while they're sitting on the shelves, they're not making any money for them. Whereas consumers, people like us who buy bottled water, we want water, we're thirsty, we want to go as little distance as possible to get it. We want to pay a reasonable amount for it, no more than any other bottled water. And then, but there are additional gains that Thank You Water offers. So it offers the convenience that you expect, but it also offers the emotional satisfaction of knowing that you are contributing to a good cause. And they try and set it up so that it doesn't cause any pains. In other words, it's equivalent to any other bottle of water you could buy. And it also resolved one potential pain where people think that perhaps they're being ripped off, they're being cheated, and being told that their money's going to a good cause when in fact it isn't. So they resolve that pain by providing the tracking mechanism so you can actually see exactly where your donation went. When you're trying to identify the value proposition, the key is to walk in the customer's shoes. Actually look at your product or service from their perspective. Are they looking for a solution? If people don't think they have a problem, they're less likely to be interested in a solution. Where do they expect to find it? If you're delivering your solution in somewhere other than where they're looking, then you're going to have trouble reaching your customers. How unhappy are they with existing solutions? If they think the status quo is fine, then it's going to be harder to attract their attention. Or if they're not happy, what are they most unhappy about? Because there's your easiest way in to get, them, to get their attention. So think about problems you experience and solutions that you've considered. When you're thinking about your own business idea, probably the first things you come up with are things that from a perspective of you as a customer you're not happy with and you think they could be done better and the good news is that's a really good way to start and that's how a lot of entrepreneurs launch their businesses. Here's another tool that you might find useful and if you do use it, if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, a link will be provided to the actual article that this comes from on Blackboard but it was developed by the same people who um, developed Blue Ocean Strategy, which you may perhaps have heard of. What it looks at is 
the stages of buyer experience. In other words, you don't just buy something, it has to get to you, you use it, you might need to buy supplements for it, it might need maintenance, and at the end of its useful life, you might need to dispose of it. But they're also what they've called utility levers, which is really saying there are dimensions of the value proposition. And I'll go through each of these in turn. Customer productivity is anything that helps the customer get things done better, faster, or at lower cost. So things like capacity are part of productivity, efficiency are part of productivity, different ways of working. One of the biggest productivity breakthroughs, of course, is Excel spreadsheets. Just imagine, in the old days, people filled those in with pencil and paper and all the calculations were done by hand. Email was a massive breakthrough when it was first introduced. Simplicity. It's interesting that as products develop and become more mainstream, they tend to get more complicated because um, features get added and nothing gets taken away. So sometimes there are what you, you can add values by simplifying. This was the real value proposition behind early Apple products like the iPod and the iPhone. Um, Amazon actually patented one-click shopping. If you were a regular customer, you could just go add to cart, buy, done. Um, anything, basically, that is simpler to use or simpler to handle in any way. Lower product range may be a form of simplicity. Aldi, yes, it's cheap, but it, a lot of people actually prefer the fact that it has a lower product range because they don't want that many choices in their life. Convenience is pretty obvious. Anything that creates convenience for the customer. And um, bear in mind that different people will have different definitions of convenience. So online banking and online shopping are massively convenient for a lot of people. Things that fit into your daily routine are handy as well. Risk is an interesting one. Anything that reduces risk for the customer, and this isn't just about safety and security, but also about reliability and reputation. So customer reviews, buyer-seller ratings are aimed at reducing risk, and this was particularly important when internet companies came into the market because one of the fears the customers had was, was trading with somebody unknown. So becoming a trusted provider was really important in that environment. Fun and image. Now, this may sound trivial, but it's probably one of the biggest selling points from very, very many products. Anything that makes you feel good or makes you feel superior. It might be something that's simply fun, has no use at all, but it, it makes you smile. Uh, it may be having the latest gadget, being an early adopter. It might be something that's expensive and high status. Um, it may be just a kind of jokey way of dealing with the customers. The, the Virgin brands are classic examples of that. And then finally, environmental friendliness is what it said in the original model. I would add social friendliness to it because that's becoming increasingly important. So. Anything that reduces um, people's impact on the environment. And thank you, water, uh, contributes here to the social aspect. So reusable, recyclable, organic, all those sorts of things. So those are the dimensions of the value proposition. But there's also the question of where do you deliver the value? At what stage in the buyer experience? So, the obvious one is purchasing. Think about it. A lot of us spend time deciding what we're going to buy before we actually go and buy it. So, there are all sorts of ways in which you can add value, making it easy to find your products or choose between products or ordering and paying. They can make a big difference. And in this day and age, when uh, online searching and online payment is pretty straightforward. Your aim should be to put as few barriers as possible between the person who's interested in your product and the actual process of buying it. Then there's delivery itself. Because obviously, this depends on what it is. But where delivery is important, um, location. Will it be delivered to your door? Pickup points, time of, of delivery, 
do you have to stay at home all day waiting for it? If it's not actually, if you're not there when something's delivered, do you have to go all the way out of town to a depot to pick it up yourself? That sort of thing. Use. Let's bear in mind that unless it's something that's immediately consumable, we use the product or service over a period of time. And for many things, that's what um, where we get the most value. For example, your phone, your laptop, your tablet device, all those sorts of things you use every day. And the usability and convenience is really important to you. Supplements may be important. This classic one here is um, laser versus inkjet printers. Inkjet printers are a lot cheaper, but the supplements, the ink, are a lot more expensive. So that's good for the business because they make more money out of you, but the customer's not going to be so keen on it. On the other hand, supplements can be, can be appealing. So accessories are a form of supplements. And of course, after-sales service can be a form of supplements too. Maintenance, that's an interesting one. I like bagless vacuum cleaners because I couldn't be bothered to go to a specialist store to buy replacement bags for my vacuum cleaner. That's a form of value proposition for me. And then finally, getting rid of it. When a product re le reaches the end of its useful life, is it easy to get rid of it? In some cases, that can be a bit of a problem. So let's see how that works out with a few examples. Amazon Online Retail. It's a customer productivity value in the purchase and delivery. So all you have to do is search on Amazon. They make it easy to search. They make recommendations for you. If you like this, you might like that. And they handle all the delivery for you. It's convenient because you don't have to leave your home. It's got a wide range as well. And it reduces risk because you can look at the reviews to decide whether you are going to like what you've ordered or whether, if you're buying a gift for somebody, whether you think they're going to like it. That's the way in which it reduces risk. Uber. Uh, convenience in purchase and delivery. So the app makes it very easy to... Um, sign up to Uber. It makes it easy to find um, how close the nearest Uber car is and decide whether you want to purchase or not. The delivery, yes, there's the actual, um, if you think of the delivery as the time between you requesting an Uber car and it actually turning up, you know where it is, you know how close it is, you know who it is and what sort of car they've got. You can even contact them. Risk, because of the ratings, you can see whether um, the, the driver who's been assigned to you has got a good rating. You know that they know if they do something out of order or don't behave well, then you can give them a poor rating. But also, the drivers know that if the passengers don't behave well, they can give them a poor rating. Appliances Online is um, a company that won me over when I ordered something minor. I think it was a toaster or a slow cooker or something. Because the purchase is very simple, the delivery is good because they actually contact you an hour before they're due to arrive and they give you a time window the day before so you don't have to hang around all day waiting for them to turn up and in most cases they'll take away your old appliance. So I decided that next time I bought a fridge I would buy it from appliances online. Now at this point a lot of people are going, well what about price? Isn't that a form of value? Well, not really, no. Price is what you pay for value. We talk about value for money. So price is the other side of value. The more value you perceive, the more you're going to be prepared to pay. There's also this aspect of compelling need to buy. How badly do your customers need what you're offering or want it? Three categories were identified by a former Swinburne academic, and I think they're a really good way of thinking about whether, uh, how to classify your product in terms of compelling need. Painkillers are the ideal because they actually resolve an urgent problem, a 
an urgent and immediate problem. I need a solution right now. Um, health, repairs. If your hot water service breaks down, then you can pretty much call a whole range of plumbers who will do same day replacement because you don't want to be without your hot shower. Vitamins are more long term benefit. I know this will be good for me in the long term, so insurance is a classic vitamin. Something in the corporate world like supply chain management, which you know will improve your efficiency, but if you don't think you're hugely inefficient, you may not see the benefit. It's something I can do someday, but I don't have to do right now. Candy is, ironically, the least needed and often the most compelling. You don't need it, but you want it. You want chocolate, if you like chocolate. Luxury goods, games consoles, iPads, a Ferrari. Those sorts of things are candy. Now, if you have a product or service that isn't something that is, has got a high compelling need to buy, well, that's not the end of the world because, let's face it, most things aren't. But how can you make it seem more compelling? You've probably experienced some of these techniques when you look at that urgency, buy now or miss out, um, limited offer, fear, if you don't have this, what might happen to you? Greed, prestige, show you are successful. It's one of the reasons people want to have a Ferrari or a Porsche. Fashion, being on trend is, is a powerful motivator for a lot of people. Convenience. Why are you here? Why not pick up one of these? So the more compelling, the easier it is to make a sale. So the greater the pain, the more compelling the need. So these techniques are about artificially increasing the pain or selling the gain. So takeaways to think about. Think about your own business ideas. What jobs do your customers need to do? What are they trying to achieve when they're using your product or service? Or what could they achieve if they used your product or service? What are the ways in which you're providing value, making it better for them? And by better, we're usually talking about better than the competition. Or reducing the pains. So this is something that perhaps they already buy or use, but it's not as good as it could be, and you can find a way to reduce that pain. It'll give you a new insight onto business ideas. So think about that as you work on your own business ideas. See you in the next module.